My name is Ole Nydal, I'm from Denmark, and this is a talk on cause and effect, also known as karma. Hope you'll enjoy it. So one point during my lectures where everybody opens their eyes wide and ro fold out their ears is when they discover that they are actually making their own lives all the time that no God from somewhere else is judging them or punishing them or anything like that, but that they are actually themselves all the time planting the seeds of their future. This is one of the most important points, you know. This is like where the whole audience suddenly, you know, land there, sit in their seats, you know, and begin to become constructive. And of course, if we look at the different religions of the world, we look at the different kinds of science and so on, we always see aspects of it. Science, of course, is totally cause and effect. But when we go from the outer world of bringing gasoline and oil into our car and then move on to the inner world, you know, of experience and what happens to us and maybe experiences from life to life and so on, then actually, you know, this clarity of logic and general understanding that people have and need to have to function in their lives is very quickly is lost. So for that reason, I would like to say a few things here that might actually be useful to some of your lives. First thing we have to know is that karma is cause and effect. It's not divine retribution. It is not what's it called fate or anything like that. Whatever hasn't happened yet can be changed. That's the first thing. The reason Buddha tells about karma is not to put our heads in a little black box or tell us that now we are going to suffer and now this or that will happen, but in order to tell us what freedom we have, what space we enjoy, what possibilities are there, how rich our mind actually is. This is what he's doing there. This is what the Buddha wants to put into our hands. Extra life quality, extra ability, and extra power to live, die, and be reborn better. That's all he wants. That's all he ever wanted. That is his whole goal. So, how can we understand karma or cause and effect? Well, you can look at Hinduism. They've got the 84,000 laws of Manu. You know, you can look in different places, you know. But if you really focus in, if you take the Buddhist view, you can condense that into four points contained inside three groups. There's a group of four points having to do with the building up of karma, how causes are created which become our future. There's another group of four which has to do with the living through of karma, the fruition, the, what comes out of that. And secondly, we have a third kind of, of or a third group which is how we get rid of it again. If we decide we have too much on our backs, you know, and want to put it down, want to get it off our shoulders, then there are also methods for doing that. Actually, the Buddha taught about cause and effect in a very interesting way, but with the many minorities in the world today, you could not do that anymore. He actually made guided tours. He took his students out and showed them people living under very extreme conditions and then saying, this happened because I did that and that life and so on. <laughs> well, today, you know, that's, you probably can't do that. You'll get all the minorities on your back very quickly, right? But I mean, generally, everything, you know, is cause and effect. And even though today we will not point by example, we can point through, like, general general life. And here, if we see how karma is built up, then actually we see that four things need to be there to bring the greatest power. Of course, if some of the things are missing, it's less. But if four things are there, the power is the most. First, we have to know how a situation is. We simply have to know what's going on. It's the first thing. Second thing is, we have to also, you know, wish to do something. There has to be a kind of motivation. The third thing is we have to do it or have it done. And the fourth thing is we have to be satisfied afterwards. These four things together make out the full batch, the full power package, which we would call karma. So knowing what a situation is like, wishing to do something, doing it or having it done, 
and being satisfied afterwards. These are the real powers. These are the very important things. So, when is karma then experienced? When is it lived out? Well, many people think that if they do something harmful and fall down the stairs afterwards, that was the fruition of that karma. This is very lucky people where that's the case. If they have such a short number of karmas waiting that things come like that, they're very lucky, right? <laughs> they're probably already enlightened. It's not like that. Actually, we have so many undigested impressions in our subconscious. We have so many things in there that actually it can take really quite a while before it comes out. Of course, people who meditate every day, who maybe spend 20, 30 minutes, you know, in deep absorption using a proper method, I can, of course, advise using the Buddhist methods, the Buddhist meditation methods. People who do that, they will gradually clean from the subconscious of their minds all the things that would otherwise disturb them. They will learn to see things as a dream, thereby losing, uh, loosening their grip around their necks and so on. But if people are not like that, you know, if people do not meditate, if they do not try to do that, then something else will happen. The karma will come up after they die. All the time while they are alive, they are absorbing new sense impressions from all directions and through all kinds of situations. But then when they die, then these outer impressions disappear. And then within a period of not more than seven weeks, the strongest tendency comes up. It's a kind of restructuring period. It's a period where the deepest seeds of one's consciousness are reawakened and are brought out. And after this has happened, you know, then one goes into the then one goes into one's next life. So the first experience is what happens after we die. I mean, when our mind, when the energy and awareness which is now in this body leaves our body and goes out then what will happen? What will we experience then? That is the first thing. So we say in Buddhism, in many cases, after seven weeks, we find future parents, we go in there again, and we take another rebirth. However, there are other states of consciousness, some where there is no solid body. And we say that the first result of karma is from the moment we die and then all the way till we either within seven weeks or after maybe much longer time unite with a human body again. I mean, what is experienced there, if happiness or suffering, if pleasant or unpleasant, that is the first result of karma. So what happens when we die is the first thing. Then when we are born human again, when again the mind that we consider ours, a stream of awareness we experience now when this unites with a fertilized egg in the womb of a mother somewhere, then at that time three more results come out from the last life, from the former karmas we build up. First, what kind of genes do we get? I mean, do we get a body that brings pleasure or one that brings pain? Secondly, what kind of environment do we get? Do we get born in the rich world? Do we get born in one of the poor and miserable places of the world, like, you know, where so many people live? Africa, South America, parts of Asia, whatever, you know. Where do we get born? Where do we find our future life? That's the second thing. And the third thing is then, what direction do we naturally have? I mean, what do we like to do? What are our inner tendencies? Do we like to help people, bring them up? Are we jovial or kind? Or would we rather shoot them or harm them or suppress them or sit on their shoulders or something like that? So this is the second point, the fruition of karma, what comes out of it. Experience when we die. When, again, human body, what kind of body? Healthy, unhealthy, long-lived, short-lived, you know, uh, joy-bringing, suffering-bringing, what kind of environment, rich, social, educated country or class, you know, or ghetto or poor country or whatever. And finally then also, what kind of tendencies do we have? Do we naturally like to do something useful or do we like to do something harmful? And the actions we then do in that next life will project us into the next life, will take us into the next life again. And then, you know, there's the last thing. 
And that is how to get rid of this. If we understand that our mind is like space, that it has never been born, that it can in no way die, and that every time we are born we have different kinds of problems. Like as a human being we get born, which hurts. We get old, sick and die, which is also not pleasant, right? And while we are here, then always we are trying to hold on to what we like, push away what we don't like, uh, <clears throat> keep what we have found and arrange ourselves with whatever we can't avoid, right? When we've understood that this changing between all these different situations all the time is not satisfactory, will not bring the result of happiness that we want, then at that time we will want to get out of it. And then comes the third group of four conditions, which means how to finish karma. And here first we have to know that something is wrong. Some people remember some terrible things they did or said. Some people, you know, just think, man, I'm much older than the Buddha when he got enlightened, and I'm still a blockhead, you know, I mean, however you think, people first have the feeling something's not all right, first point. Second point is they want to do something about it. And here in Buddhism we have some amazing practices, some very wonderful practices. I have here at my side the Buddha Diamond Mind. His name is Diamond Mind, and he is the purifying power of all the Buddhas. It's a point where all their power comes together in one form, in order to remove, you know, everything harmful in our subconscious. We can compare him to uh, industrial cleaning of our subconscious or something like that. I mean, it's a very powerful method that he has a hundred syllable mantra, he has a six syllable mantra, which are taught in our Kamakachi Buddhist centers around the world. We have 180, which is a lot. And so everybody can learn. We have booklets and everything. And this, you know, would be a very effective way of really getting rid of that, getting rid of the negative seeds. The third thing is then that one decides not to do it again. And, of course, one knows one may do it quite a few times still, right? But still one will say, I will not, till it becomes so embarrassing to keep promising it that one actually stops. <laughs> and the fourth thing is then trying to do the opposite, that one really tries to do the opposite of the negativity one has done. And here I'd just like to give an example, and there are many wonderful examples like generosity, how one is reborn rich and healthy and strong and everything. But the one example people remember best, by my experience, is a negative example. So, because I'm a teacher here, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, I have to put the most effective example on you, not the most pleasant, right? And the way in which I will try to make you understand about a cause and effect is actually through the example of killing. As I said, I could have used a nice one, but killing everybody remembers. So for a killing to be complete, four things must be there. We must know it's a human being, we must wish to kill him, we must kill them or have them killed, and we must be happy afterwards, or at least satisfied. If any of these conditions are missing, like with an abortion, where people are not satisfied afterwards usually, and they don't also really know it's a human being, but still, instead of doing the reasonable thing and adopting the child away, they go and kill it, which is blooming stupid, right, and really, really negative, right, because... The Western world needs children, right? We need the children we can have. Well, anyway, in a case that, or in a case of a single accident, somebody standing in front of your car on a foggy night, that'd just be one thing. You kill him, right? You didn't want to. You didn't think it over, and you are miserable afterwards. But anyway, the more of these four things come together, the stronger the killing is. The stronger is a box of impressions that we plant in our subconscious and which will come up when we die. So the next thing is, how is this felt? Well, when the sensory impressions from the outside disappear and we do not receive anything more from, from the outer world, then the subconscious impressions come up. And at that time, if the mind is full of killing, you know, we will experience being killed ourselves and often and for a long time. And uh, then the worst thing is that this has been going on since beginningless time. We've all, this has always been happening. Mind is like space, it hasn't been born, it cannot die. And all the time this cause and effect has been working. 
And for that reason, it's very important to learn the different things, find out how the karmas work, and in this way be able to set others and oneself free. Lama, can someone change their karma? And if so, how do the Buddhists do that? Yes, um, that's something one has to repeat in the West again and again. Uh, everything is cause and effect. There is no creating, punishing or judging entity out there. There is not. We all the time feed our minds with subconscious impressions which will bring results in the future. So the Buddha teaches us in two ways. First, he teaches us what is useful and what's harmful. But of course, this is often not enough because, you know, we can think it, but it's difficult to do. Then what he does also is he gives us a certain distance so that, and that's called meditation. So we can learn to see the feeling appear in the mind, play around the mind and dissolve back into the mind. Again, we can see this movement of the, of the feelings and thoughts in the mind. So if we can do that, we can begin to choose the comedies and avoid the tragedies of life. And finally, then, also, we can really decide against certain things where we always make mistakes. I mean, everybody has something. They do something. They say something. They always, you know, there's something like their pet problem, right? And there one can just cut through and say, I will not say that anymore. I will not do that anymore, and so on. And if one tries that long enough, one can cut the root of that different kind of negativity. Of course, this was the negative side. There's also the positive side, using the body to give love, to protect, to give other things, speech to make them into friends and see the world and their situation and work together and the mind to share in the good things they do, to wish them everything good and to think clearly. I mean, that would be the positive side. Lama Oli, why does karmic perpetuation continue? Well, actually, um, if we look at the nature of mind, it's probably best explained or compared to an eye. An eye can see everything outside, but it cannot see itself. In the same way, our mind can experience so many outer things, but it has no idea about that which is experiencing. It doesn't know its own nature. And this ignorance, basic ignorance of the mind, creates a duality. It creates the space nature of mind, that which is aware, which is looking, hearing, feeling, which is in its nature like space, will think I, and that which is experienced outside will be you or the others, or something different or separate. Even though you cannot find a real me here or real you or something else there, but only masses of molecules and atoms changing place and nothing ultimately disappearing back into space, then still people or beings experience it like that until enlightenment. So when there is a me and there is a you, then attachment will arise for what we want, aversion against what we don't like. And when those feelings are there, then greed will come, what we have we like to keep, you know, jealousy will come, the ones we don't like, we don't want to see happy. And out of confusion, the stupid kind of pride will come, the I'm better than you pride. Of course, the wise pride is, uh, aren't we all great, right? The inclusive pride is really smart, always good company, everything meaningful, right? But the I'm better than you pride just makes everything poor and you have nobody to share with it and everything like that. So when these disturbing feelings are there, the Buddha says, I haven't counted them, but he says 84,000 different combinations of these disturbing feelings are there. And when those disturbing feelings are there, these combinations, people think they're real. Even though they weren't angry five minutes before, they won't be angry five minutes later, they still think the 10 minutes they're angry, they think it's real. So they speak and they act. And that means they use their bodies to kill others, to harm them sexually, to steal their things or cheat them or whatever. They use their speech to slant or gossip or use rough talk or confuse or split them up. And they use their minds in order to envy, to hate and to be confused, right? And then this then, you know, then when they do these things after a certain while, because the world is cause and effect, they get results. And when they get results, they forget that they planted the cactuses they're sitting in. They think the others did it. And then again, they react and create more trouble, right? And this is simply how it is. This is how it is. Is there such a thing as shared karma? No, 
Everybody thinks says when they see a lot of suffering in the world, like you know, right now the Tutsis in Africa, or before the Jews, and before that, you know, the Russians under Stalin, or Cambodians under Pol Pot. People may think, oh, it's like same karma, you know, or they look in an ant hill and they all look the same and do the same, and they think there must be one karma there, <laughs> but it's not true. Beings each have their own karma. There is the individual karma, you know, which is... Uh, and this individual karma then brings you into a surrounding, brings you into a setting with a lot of other people who have a similar karma, bringing you to a certain birth at a certain time and at a certain place. And then these different things interact and work, but there is no, what you can say, collective karma. There is one thing, though, that's also good to know is, of course... And I mean, our eyes tell us that, and our newspapers tell us that, and our television tells us that, that once we have become born human due to individual acts before, then while we are here, we share, of course, all the human karmas of like and dislike and a certain sensory apparatus and all those other things, you know, and, and, and the whole sensual exchange with the world around us from a human body. That is clear, of course. But... The moment we leave these bodies again, you know, everybody's mind is out there experiencing and maturing its own fruits. This was on cause and effect, on the freedom of the mind, uh, in Indian called karma, in Tibetan legende, action, cause and effect. Thank you. <laughs>